This has come about, this event, in a very interesting way, in terms of some research that I did a couple of years ago with colleagues across four universities, Queen's Belfast, Edinburgh University in Scotland, Cardiff in Wales, and Sussex in England. And it was a project where we were looking at how social workers communicated um, with children. And having completed that research, part of our responsibility as, res as researchers is to make sure that what we find out in research has an impact back into people's lives, whatever that research might be, medical, social, economic, engineering. And so this is all part of that agenda, really, to try and help people understand what we discovered and then see how our insights can make a difference in practice. Um, and in doing that, I had an opportunity to speak at a conference in Scotland where I heard Mary Glasgow, who's the Chief Executive, Chief Executive of Children First, which is the equivalent of the NSPCC in Scotland, talking about using kit bags in their work with children. And that's where the connection with Margaret at the back, who is the founder of Kit Bags through the International Futures Forum, a small Scottish-based charity, and Joni, who worked with them initially and now works with Children First, this collaboration came together as I became familiar with Kitbag and began to think about its potential in the social work context, where currently it's being used particularly in schools, but in other places too, but not so much in social work. So that's a big part of today, bringing Kitbag to people's attention um, and helping us think about how we can spread its use um, throughout the social work community. And then, you know, serendipitously then, a conversation with Baswa linked us into this campaign that our work through the Talking and Listening to Children project and kit bag comes under this umbrella of the Baswa 8020 campaign. It absolutely aligns with the commitments of that campaign to try and shift this balance in terms of where social workers are spending their time and why social workers come into the profession and the disconnect between many people's <coughs> daily experience of practice and actually what motivated them to come into the profession in the first place, which wasn't about sitting in front of a computer, it was about helping people who are experiencing difficulties in their everyday lives. So this has been a very so kind of serendipitous journey so far in terms of these three different um, paths coming together. And this is a pivotal moment, I think, for us to think collectively about how we can make the Talking and Listening to Children project, the Kit Bag Initiative, and Baswa's campaign begin to shift some of the rather entrenched dynamics in practice as it currently is. So the backdrop to the um, Talking and Listening to Children campaign was really about the um, extensive history we have of children not being effectively listened to. And this goes back, um, right back to 1973, to Maria Colwell and the death of Maria Colwell, which was really the beginning of the more, what we might think about as the modern child protection system. But this is when people began to become really concerned about how were we relating to children. And of course, since then, you know, things haven't um, changed entirely. Things have got better, and I would suggest there's always going to be child deaths. That's a reality we have to acknowledge. Um, and there are, are roughly 57 deaths a year of children at the hands of their parents or somebody they know. So it's not uncommon. What happens is we get to hear ones that get politi politically kind of activated, I would suggest. So we have to live with that difficult reality, but we also have to think about how can we, as effectively as possible, as Maris highlighted, hear the voice of children. So serious case reviews and inquiries have continued to be um, a recurrence in our um, practice. There's recognition that communication skills are something that are challenging in terms of how we relate to children. So what is it that's happening? And I think this is important for us to think about. Whenever we're talking about having done research um, with social workers, and I say with social workers, not on social workers, there's a real danger that the findings we have can be read as criticisms of practice. Mm -hmm. 
So I think it's really important to be aware that anything that is said in relation to the findings from our research are not about blaming, are not about criticising social workers, but trying to understand and be curious about how has this come about? How is it that, you know, 40 years after Maria Colwell's death, we are still having some of the same conversations about social workers having difficulty listening and communicating with children? What's going on in the system? It's not that individuals don't want to have those conversations, but somewhere systemically, this is more problematic. And there's been quite a lot of research, too, about what social workers say they do, but what we're not seeing is, or haven't seen to date, what they do do. And that was really the motivation for our research, that we had the opportunity to go out and see social workers in action. So we were contributing something different to the knowledge base, rather than just talking to social workers about how they said they communicated with children. So that's how the project came about. And here's the ongoing story, really. Victoria Colombier, again, something that got highlighted and brought into the public domain. But there are many children that are not named here who are also children who very tragically died, um, who were known to social workers. And of course, one of the most recent ones being baby Peter. And I did want to kind of put another picture of a child on top to say it's not all about kind of tragedy because we're working with lots of children where things effectively get managed and children don't die. But I think it's also important we have to hold that in mind. We can't deny this heavy weight that is there for us in the work that we do. So the Talking and Listening to Children project was uh, four countries, so all the countries of the UK. Um, it was a qualitative piece of work where we were trying, as I said, to do practice near research. We were trying to work alongside social workers to understand what was going on in their everyday practice. So a lot of the knowledge that we've built on in relation to how communication happens with children is based on those extraordinary circumstances of Baby Peter, of Victoria Columbia, and the recommendations that come out of those reports. But what we have to remember is that most of the work with children is going on with positive outcomes um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So we needed to understand the ordinary, to also understand when things weren't going quite so well, what was stopping good communication happening. And there were three phases in the project. The first was um, having researchers located in children's teams across the whole range from duty and assessment, children with disabilities, long-term teams. We felt pretty confident we'd covered all the different aspects of childcare social work. So that went on over a period of several months in, in two sites in each of the four countries, so eight teams in total. And then we did some closer, more focused work, which was around video-stimulated recall, where we videoed social workers having encounters, ordinary everyday encounters with children, perhaps something to do with an assessment or preparation for a review meeting, where the video was taken and then the social workers were invited with the researcher to review the video and look in fine-grained detail at how the communication <coughs> happened and what happened at different points, and perhaps where they felt there was a connection with the child, and where they felt perhaps there was some sort of disconnect. So again, it was very um, informative in terms of what we've called kind of micro-movement and delicate agency, as people were having to negotiate very carefully in relation to sensitive and challenging conversations. And that's currently, there are publications of this that are on the PowerPoint that people will be able to access. But there's a publication about that work um, in progress at the moment. And then the third stage, which is what this is about, is about developing the resources from the Talking and Listening to Children project to make them more widely available, and then also to be developing impact of it. <coughs> so we've got a website that people can go to and look at, that Russell, who's in the room taking photographs, um, can claim all the glory for. Um, and it's a great website with lovely colour ranges and things that suit my love of blue. Um, so that's good. Um, but this is where this comes in, really, the impact that we want to make off this project. 
So what were the questions that we asked? They're four pretty simple questions, really. What are social workers doing when they're out communicating with children? How do they experience and understand what they're doing? So we would follow social workers out on perhaps an initial visit or an ongoing visit to a child in a family or seeing a child on their own. We would accompany the social worker and before or on the journey, we would be asking them, you know, what is it this visit's about? What do you think is going to be achieved? How are you imagining it's going to happen? And then we would do the same after the visit. So we'd observe the visit or the encounter. What is your task with the strangers dynamics? Well, that, that, that's interesting. I mean, one of the things is about ethics approval. Um, a great concern was, you know, who's going to, um, which family is going to want to do this? And of course, families didn't have an issue with this. We spent a long time agonising how our family's going to be happy. We didn't video the visits, we just um, took notes. We didn't audio record them either, we just did observation notes. But the families were very happy um, that we were going in and our focus was on the social workers' performance, not them as a family being under scrutiny. So that was one of the first really eye-opening things about... Um, families not wanting us there. They wanted us there in order for practice to improve. Inevitably, there's a sense in which things will be different. But I think with the overall, we did 82 visits. So I think there was enough reason to think the learning we got across all of them had some value. Although, of course, having somebody there will make a difference. But social workers talked about that and also said that after a while, they forget that you're there. So I don't think it's as big as we might think it is, but we can't rule it out. Yeah, but really, really important question. So before and after interviews um, with the social workers, as well as just spending time in the teams, observing team practices, observing where do those reflective conversations happen? Do people <coughs> relate to each other? Are people going back to the office? Often people didn't go back to the office because they couldn't park. So they would back up all their visits. Yeah, everybody gets that. Um, they'd back up all their visits. So you do one visit, and it could be quite a difficult one. And then you immediately, 10 minutes later, drive around the corner to do another one, which is emotionally charged and challenging. And I think the fact that we work in homes is often underestimated in terms of the additional demands on us to manage the space, because we're not in our own, perhaps, clinical spaces health professions might be working. People are not coming um, to our office. So that's a really challenging bit every time to renegotiate your way into a home. So if perhaps you're doing four visits and you're doing them at the end of the day, by definition, because that's when children who are at school are out of school, immediately you can begin to see how, how difficult that can be. But often it's quite pragmatic things like car parking that causes people to organise their day like that. Or, and physically not being able to get back into the office because you can't park, or you know when you get in there won't be a desk. So people then get told, it's okay, there's Wi-Fi in the car park. <laughs> I mean, that is just not good enough, is it? But that's the sort of message people are being given now. And the importance of us having spaces, as Maris has already said, to reflect and think about what the work does to us is really critical. So they were our questions and that was the backdrop. What were our sort of overarching findings or key messages? And these won't be a surprise to you. And this is often the way with research, I think. We don't un uh, uncover something um, incredibly new, but by the way the research has been conducted, we're able to say something that is systematically evidenced rather than anecdotally reported. So I think these things won't surprise you on here, these key messages. But we can say now, having been out with social workers and this number of social workers in this range of settings, that these are common themes that come up in relation to what we saw and how social workers operate. That the complexity of the context, which I've just highlighted really by mentioning working in a home and the challenges of that, that we have to be sensitive to every situation. So I think it came up on one of Maris's slides about when you've met one child or you've met one family, you have met one child, you have met one family. Every child, every family is slightly different. There may well be some common themes that run through, 
but how they impact on that particular family is unique to them. So you've always got to be mindful of that as you, you know, open yourself up to what's going on in this family when the referral says concerns about neglect or there's been concern that the child might have sustained some sort of injury. You can't go into kind of a robotic response. So often people have said off this research, um, okay, so what is it we need to do? You know, people have wanted kind of magic bullet solutions. So, okay, you've done the research, tell us how to do it. And sometimes people are quite disappointed, actually, that we can s all we can say is each child is unique, their context unique, the case or the circumstances in which they live is unique. And that's what we've got to constantly be working with. And therefore, these are the implications for our practice in our organisation, that we need spaces to think about the uniqueness of each case. We can't just go out and formulaically uh, re-enact things one time after another. So there is no magic solution, and in working with, with Kitbag as a resource, that is not the magic solution either. It's our capacity to, sustain, to make in the first place and sustain authentic relationships. And that's again why we need spaces and places to think about when that's working well, what is it that's um, achieving, helping that be achieved? And when that's more problematic and challenging, what's getting in the way? What am I finding difficult? What's the family finding difficult? So, you know, when you go back to your authorities and they say, okay, what have we got to do? Make sure you give them the message. It's not as simple as there is an answer. There is an understanding and there <coughs> is knowledge but it has to be worked with continually. And one way I'm trying to sort of conceptualise this a bit, and I think it speaks to the complexity of the work, is what I'm framing as paradoxical practice. And the idea is of, of a paradox is that the two things that are um, seemingly incompatible trying to um, align with each other. So it is a, a creative tension that you're trying to work with when you're facing paradoxical situations. So what do I mean by, by paradox? Well, thinking the unthinkable, by which I mean when you think of the circumstances of Victoria Climbier or baby Peter, needing to allow your mind to go to the place where Victoria Climbier was wrapped in bin bags and kept in the bath. Now that's such a difficult image and experience to hold on to, that the first thing you want to do is, is move on to something else. But that was her reality. And that's what we're having to do when we're having to imagine, okay, what's going on in that family when I'm not there? Do I think those children are okay? What might be happening when they go to bed or when somebody is affected by having taken substances? It's really challenging. How do we demonstrate authoritative empathy? I think this is another way of framing care and control, really. How do we assert the statutory responsibility and power we have in an empathic way? It's a very problematic um, professional skill to acquire. How do we discreetly intrude on a family? Because actually we're being asked and required to go into intimate places in family life. How do we do that in an appropriate way that we get in enough, but that we don't overstep the boundary? Particularly when, again, we're doing this in people's homes. How are we respectful, but sufficiently assertive? How do we hold doubtful trust? How do we hold hopeful realism? That we want to be optimistic that things can change, but we have to be realistic that they might not. And this notion of vulnerable competence I really like because it's something about in order to be competent as a professional you have to know your own vulnerability. So I, have, I think we have to become better at talking with each other and in the spaces and places we have about how we feel about the work when actually we find it really difficult to work with a particular family because of the level of hostility or the level of depression in a family or whatever it might be that makes it hard for us to engage, perhaps because of something in our own history, something of that child that you earlier had in your mind as you were recalling your own experiences. 
And for me, when, when students are moving into the workplace, I always <coughs> encourage them to think of vulnerable competence actually is a quality that I think is a sign of a capable, growing social worker, not somebody who comes with this false kind of sense of completeness. And that's true across your professional life. So it's something about having to walk a tightrope. I was talking about this somewhere else recently. These paradoxes are how do you negotiate so you don't fall one way or the other into complete pessimism or unreal optimism. How do you hold that line? And I decided that probably all um, local authority or any away days, staff away days, we should go on tightrope walking um, <laughs> classes or something to see what that's like, to see how hard it is to hold that balance. Because that's what we're having to do professionally all the time, walk a professional tightrope of kind of judgment and decision making. And these are just some of the quotes that come up in relation to these um, different qualities um, or different paradoxical practices. So the first one about doubtful trust here. She says, they appear open, this family, as opposed to they are open. You don't ever really know. Social worker working with a mother with an eight-month-old baby, trying to be authority, authoritatively empathic. So the mother's worried that the baby might be taken. I don't want you to take him off me, and was kind of saying, you know, Catherine, the social worker, we do that when we need to, but I'm not coming out to do that today. So yes, we have that power, but today isn't the day where I've got that level of concern. Discrete intrusion. The second one in particular, where school visit to a five-year-old girl. I found it was like, yes, it was, yeah, it was a good visit, you know. I don't think I've left her with any sort of distress or trauma. And that's, again, if we're not wanting to judge that, but to be curious about what was leaving her feeling that if that's a possibility she could have been. So does that mean she's not intruding enough? She's not asking those kind of courageous, having those courageous conversations because she's fearful of what it might evoke in a child. So there's the question at the end. When are things too discreet or too intrusive? Too doubting or too trusting? Too authoritative or too empathic? It's there. This is all data from the interviews with, with social workers. So it's what they're struggling with, what undoubtedly you all struggle with on a daily basis. So there's something about paradox that I'm trying to work with and help people think about to understand why the job is so challenging. And then this idea too about social pedagogy. And this is where, where Kitbag comes in. <coughs> so actually I'm gonna just flip some slides and then come backwards. <coughs> because we launched a um, campaign, actually let's just take that out for a minute. Um, we launched a campaign, a Twitter campaign, as part of this um, initiative. Um, and we simply asked the question, does your local authority provide you with resources to undertake direct work with children? Um, and um, we had some responses to that. Did anybody engage in that in the room? Did anybody see it on Twitter? I don't know how many people Twitter, tweet, whatever you do. I'm not very good at it. Um, I had to get somebody to kind of set it all up for me. But um, this is the response that we got. I'm just trying to flip through because they're animated. Here we go. Um, we had 150, was it in the end, 56, I think 51. And it's an absolute 70-30 split. 70% of the people that responded said that the local authorities didn't provide them with anything to do their work with children. 30% did. Um, and it's interesting um, because since launching this campaign, um, some local authorities have got back in touch with me and said, we do do things. Um, so Essex, anybody from Essex? No? Essex apparently provide their social workers with something. Dagenham was another example. So it's really interesting to be hearing the different sorts of things that local authorities are doing. So it's not an absolutely absolute desert out there. But the vast majority were saying, no, we're not provided with um, resources, whatever they might be. 
So let's just do it in the room. In terms of which, who, whose local authority they would say does give you something to do work with children? <coughs> Not very many, about six. So it would be interesting. We haven't quite got time now, but it would be interesting to hear. I'd love you to come and tell me what it is and what it looks like. Um, because often also what people talk about is if they have got something from their local authority, they normally refer to pens and paper and things that you can <coughs> photocopy. It doesn't actually go much beyond that. Or they say, we did have a box in the room once, but once everybody had used the stuff, it didn't get replaced. So this sense it's a one-off event. It's not something that every social worker has something of. And that's when I say something more about Kitbag in a moment, we'll, we'll think about that. Um, so there is something going on here because um, I was saying earlier to people, if you were a doctor, you wouldn't be expected to make people better without having access to medicines and drugs. If you were a school teacher, you wouldn't be expected to work without some sort of blackboard, whiteboard, some sort of board. Jane. Sorry, I just wondered if you asked social workers how many of them provide the equipment for themselves. For themselves. Yeah. Yes. Because that's certainly my experience. Yeah. My dad found a car boot sale for pound shops. Yes. Mm -hmm. So have you asked that question? No, but that's the interesting thing, I think, because that's exactly what people say. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't got the resources in the room, they say, and, and this was the case in our research, people had boots, and our researchers saw people with a box in the boot with things they had put together themselves. But that's precisely why we wanted to ask the question, does your employer provide you? Because people are saying, we are paying for it ourselves. And that seems to me unacceptable. In the voluntary sector, that's where things are different. But local authorities, on the whole, this is the picture. And so that's exactly the point, really. People are providing it for themselves where they realise that's what they should be doing, or recognise they need that in their practice. But also, because that expectation isn't there that you need things, even though I have to take responsibility as an educator, because we um, do direct work with the students that we have at Sussex, we help them think about what they will need in terms of, of practice, but we don't provide them with that. Um, so then I think when they go out, and the, out, the climate out there is that there isn't anything, it seems to me that it drops off the expectation that actually communicating with children you might need something to broker that. So when we were doing our research, the percentage of um, social workers that were using some sort of resource, hazard a guess, what percentage? Who were using something to communicate with children other than just words? 50. Any advance? 70. 70? 30. That table wins it in terms of being closest, but less than 20%. Less than 20% were using anything. And this was a staggering finding, really. Because something's going wrong between the training, the education, and people getting out there, and the expectation in the workplace. Because we all know that if we're talking with a child, I don't know, I, th I would argue a child of any age, and I think Kitbag will say the same, that actually Kitbag can, can straddle all ages. That appropriate kind of resources for communicating with any child are necessary because children don't eyeball you in the same way and have a conversation. Social pedagogy, which was the slide which was where I was, is about something they called the third thing. The third, it's got a different name. Common third. Common third, thank you. The common third. That there's something that mediates. It might be going for a walk. It might be being in the car. But it equally might be a resource, something like um, kit bag. And my aim with our students is that if we could find a way of equipping every student that we have coming on our programme with a kit bag at the beginning of their placement, it's already set an expectation with those students about having something. And I'm also struck, I'm a bit ambitious about this, but I'd like to think that if every social worker in the land had access to a kit bag, then that um, really salient um, figure that Maris showed us in relation to the stability index, that social workers might change, and inevitably social workers do change for children, perhaps more frequently than is ideal, but if the common denominator was a kit bag, so that they knew, a child knew that a social worker came with a kit bag, then there's continuity and consistency for the child, 
And the child can also help the social worker understand themselves, the child's life, by leading in terms of how the kit bag is used. So that it's the resource, but it's led by the child, not by the social worker. So it's an ambitious aim, but it's something that I'd like to think then that everybody has access to something that isn't just something that they've put together, but is thought about in terms of mental health professionals have informed the evidence of things going into kit bag, and there's consistency across the field. <laughs> These are resources on the website um, in relation to thinking about how we get in the mindset to do the work, how we create the space to do the work, how we um, manage good endings in the work. And these are digital resources that you can access um, and use if you're somebody in learning development, um, use yourself, use with your team. But one of the things we found in making them um, is that actually it's very helpful for social workers to have somebody facilitating them and using them. So one of the first bits of our impact work has been working with Brighton and Hove and East Sussex and we've run TLC workshops where these resources have been a kind of framework for the practitioners to think about how they develop their work with children and working in a particular way with a, a model that Jess will just say something about. So Jess? Jess Taylor, an independent consultant working with us, with a colleague, facilitated these workshops. And she'll just say a little bit about how they went and also what practitioners found about them. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Gillian. Um, yeah, so my name is Jess Taylor, um, and I was lucky enough, uh, alongside my colleague Karen Bailey, uh, to be commissioned um, to really have a bit more of a look at these web-based resources and to think about what would it be like to actually bring these into social workers' practice and how might we do that. Um, actually, I don't think I need to change slides at the moment. Um, so what we did is we thought about this idea of the child case context model, this ecological model. And one of the ways that I work um, is this, this sort of whole systems model, really easy to say, what does it actually mean in practice? Um, but we thought if we took this idea of um, reflection um, at a sort of inside me perspective, um, how do I feel, what are some of my barriers, uh, what are some of the tensions that I experience day to day that get in the way of working in the way that I want to, um, and take that kind of reflection into a group setting and then ground it within an organisational context that we could really get some interesting conversations and actions flowing. Um, so we used something called action inquiry to do that. Um, again, it's an ecological model. Um, so we, over a six month period, looked at these web-based resources um, and um, we created <coughs> two hour sessions every month where social workers could come and talk and reflect together about their practice. Um, about the things that they felt <coughs> confident about doing, about some of the things that they felt scared of, where they felt vulnerable, what they wanted to change, why they came into the work that they did in the first place. <coughs> and some of the things that came out of that, and I guess actually I'm going to go back a minute because Gillian started off by doing something which was to create a breathing space. Um, and that's something in any work that I do, any facilitation that I do, is I just create some spaciousness, some time to pause, some time to breathe. Because Gillian also talked about when, when we don't have that in our lives, um, and I worked in the field of uh, violence against women and girls for, for about 14 years, and I remember this feeling of when I feel overwhelmed, and when my staff members feel overwhelmed, we do go into autopilot. Um, and we do that in order to survive, sometimes, survival strategy. So what Karen and I really wanted to do is to create a sense of space and pace within these sessions, and to use these web-based resources to explore uh, the different aspects of working relationally with children and what that actually means in practice. And one other thing I'd like to highlight is we did this over a period of time because we asked social workers in between each session to hold what I would call an inquiry or a question in mind. And so some of the things that people held 
was something like, what drives my approach and what dilemmas does this present? I will notice when I fill in a child's silence with my own thoughts and feelings, or when I answer their questions because they're not speaking and I feel uncomfortable with silence. What is my relationship with silence? Can I experiment with that? And what happens when I do? And so social workers would come back with some reflections and some learning from each of those between session experiments, if you like. And so by the end of those six sessions, um, most social workers said that they, what they reported was a change in their sense of why they did the work that they did, their confidence levels, and then tr their trust in themselves to take more risks, but what they also talked about was some of the ongoing limitations within the wider organisational context, and that does come back to things like resources. But it also comes back to something really important that I think was touched on uh, at the very beginning of the day, which was this idea of relationship-based practice, a leadership cascade model within organisations. And my question is, well, what does that look like in practice? What does that mean, and how might that help social workers to really work relationally and confidently with children in the way that in our groups they were saying that they really wanted to. So it was a really wonderful piece of work. Um, and um, I, I was very likely Julie and I will be doing more work together around that. If you'd like to ask any more questions um, about the project, about the pilot, about some of the outcomes, I'd be really delighted to answer questions because it was, it, yeah, I felt very passionately about it and creating that time for reflection. We, we really all need that. Mm. So this, this quote really speaks, this was one of the really powerful quotes. It actually came um, from a Brighton <coughs> social worker. And you can just read it and, and see that there was a, a sea change in how she understood what she was doing. You know, I love this way she says, talking about doing stuff. Now I realise that I actually play or do things with the children and I actually still get information out of them you know, that something different is happening and there's a quality of relationship that I would imagine if we had the child's quote there, there would be something about, you know, now I, I get on with her or something about, you know, now we do do things together and they would get it. Because you often hear children say, oh, I don't want them coming with another three houses. I can't bear to do another three houses. And even if you turn them into islands, it's still three islands. So they quickly see through you. Um, whereas again, something about kit bag is that, and Joni and, and Margaret will say this much more eloquently than me, but is about the child leads you and, and they will show you what to do with it. And you have to trust that you will learn something through that. It won't just be arbitrary. Provided the child knows why you are there, that communication will be meaningful, but it might be that you've got to do a bit more thinking about it to understand what you've learned. Children don't just give you the answer, how are you today? You know, I'm very well. You know, and actually when we say that normally, it's pretty inauthentic, isn't it? It's just formulaic. Um, I do want to just say a quick um, anecdote from, not anecdote, it's, well, it's, a, it's an example from our research in, in Ireland, Northern Ireland. So um, Karen Winter, my colleague, was doing the research there, and she went to a visitor family when it was the marching season. Um, so, you know, in the background, in the social and political background of the country, there would be the bands and the trumpets and the drums, you know, as people are marching. So when, she, when the social worker arrives at this family, and she knows the children, she knows the family, and she gets on well with them, and the children welcome her with a fanfare. They've got like a tambourine and a whistle, and they're, ch -ch 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 -ch, you know, as they open the door. And from Karen's perception of how the social worker engaged, she didn't acknowledge that with the children. She went straight in and started talking with the mother. Um, and so the children just got louder, you know, the banging <laughs> and the whistling got louder. And then when they realized that wasn't working, they put down um, those um, instruments and they started just kicking a ball into the room. And that still didn't seem to get the attention of the social worker. And eventually they just started lounging around in the chairs where the social worker was, you know, in the sitting room where the social worker was talking with the mother. And then eventually, after she talked with the mother, she went to work with the children and she brought out um, 
uh, you know, happy faces and sad faces, you know, a, a sheet of emotions, and ask them to say what their emotion was today. Well, you can imagine how actually sort of inaccurate probably what they were able to say in that was, because they'd been telling her what they were feeling very clearly. And I guess, again, not to judge this social worker, but to wonder how might we help people think about. Very challenging, I think, when you're working with the parents and the children. I think that's one of our biggest challenges, because often parents have a strong child in themselves, don't they? That if you're working with the children, they can be quite disruptive because they want your attention. So I'm not suggesting this is easy. But what might have happened to enable those children to know that, you know, when I've spoken to your mum for 10 minutes, then I'm going to attend to you. And possibly, you know, here's kit bag, why don't you have a look at that whilst I'm doing this, and then we'll do it, or something. But there was a misalignment there where those children won't have felt recognised, I would suggest. And it's those kind of examples that help us see what the challenge is, because I'm not suggesting it's not challenging, because I think when you've got responsibility for the parents and the child, or children, it's really difficult. And there's strong grounds, I believe, for co-working, um, so that you can you know, divide up the responsibilities. But just very quickly, before we just get you doing a bit of thinking as we bring this to an end, just again, some of the quotes from the, the impact workshops, the sort of um, impression people had from doing them. And I'm just <coughs> going to bring them up and allow you to... Um, to read them for yourselves. And perhaps to highlight the one at the bottom here, really, I think, which speaks to what I've already highlighted, really, that often that's the nature of the resources people feel that they've got available. It's something that's a bit shoddy. Um, and already, I think, as a profession, we can often feel that we are undervalued and misunderstood. And I think when the resources that we have aren't of a standard too, that just reinforces a sense of, you know, we're a bit makeshift, we're a bit can do. And there's something I think particularly about the kit bag resource that people have said to me already in just conversation that it's about, it, it's, ra it's not corporate. There's something quite, you know, it, it's got a homemade feel to it. So it feels like it's something quite real. Again, some of the more um, mainstream perhaps things that, I don't know what people might use, but things like talking mats or things that, uh, they can be very good I think for children with disabilities. But some of the things that just don't look quite so comfortable I suppose is what I'm trying to say. So, <coughs> in the, the next half of the morning after a break, Joni and Margaret are going to tell us about the background to kit bag and how kit bag has been used. And I'd like to challenge anybody in the room to come up with a scenario where they think kit bag wouldn't be appropriate. And I'll put money on it that Joni and Margaret will be able to say, ah, but we've used it in this way. And it's also used, and I think it would be helpful for them to tell us about using it with professionals, using it with teams. <coughs> and children first use it with, when they're having their team meetings. So it's about emotional literacy for all of us. It's not just for children. And I think that's really critical. We need it as much as children need it to help us develop our relationships and our communication. The way that we're going to be moving forward with it is we're, working with, we're going to be working with five authorities in the first instance. So some people are in the room who have um, said they'd like to work with us. Telford, Staffordshire, Birmingham, Coventry, and help me with the last one. Rotherham. Rotherham, thank you. Um, but if other people either have the capacity to speak to their authority or want us to speak with the authority on their behalf, do have conversations with me, have conversations with Jess, have conversations with Margaret and, and Joni. But we'd be very interested to think how we can take these things further in the most kind of cost-effective and meaningful way that we can, because we're not doing any of this um, uh, unaware of the backdrop of local authority budgets and finances. So just in the last sort of eight minutes of the session, there's some questions here that I'd like again to just invite you on your tables to have a conversation about you won't get through all of them. One may particularly strike you. But very simple questions. What is your experience of communicating with children? What do you find most challenging? What would help you to develop your communication skills? How does your organisation support you in your work? As Jess was saying, it's not about individuals having to take all the responsibility for this. 
And if a child you work with were here today, what would they say they like from social workers? <laughs>